Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another interview. Um, this is an SBL interview for History Valley Podcast. And today I am joined by Professor David Joannis Trobisch. And today we'll be discussing the development of the New Testament, the compilation of the New Testament, and the canonization of the New Testament. So welcome to the History Valley Podcast, Professor Trobisch. Thank you very much. I'm glad, to, glad that you have me. You've uh, just recently released uh, your uh, a new book of yours. Can you tell the audience a little bit about that before we get to the questions? Yeah. Well, surprise, I have it here with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was released by uh, Fortress Press, and the title is On the Origin of Christian Scripture, mm -hmm. uh, the Formation of the New Testament Canon during the Second Century. Mm -hmm. And uh, can readers get it on Amazon, you know, yes. Kindle, and Barnes and Noble? Is that all yes. out there? Mm -hmm. gotcha. Just look for on the origin of Christian scripture or for my name, Trobish, T R O B I S C H. I'll remind of, uh, just want to tell viewers to check the description below to the History Valley Amazon affiliate link to purchase uh, David Trobish's book um, on Amazon. So I'd like to start us out with this question. Um, Marcion is the early, he's the earliest known person to have compiled some kind of canon. Uh, he has his collection of Paul's letters, the Apostolicon. He's got his gospel. Um, and I know that in scholarship, in Marcionite scholarship, there's this question, there's this, there's this connection, there's this relationship between Marcion and Luke. And some scholars say that Marcion and Luke may have copied a, a common source. Some claim, most claim that Marcion copied Luke, short abbreviated Luke. But you say different. You say Luke copied Marcion. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, so what you need to know about me, first of all, is I'm a scholar, so mm -hmm. I'm not a, a pastor or don't have to be aware of hurting feelings of people. But we, as we understand scholarship that we follow evidence and then we mm -hmm. look at the evidence and we construct our theories. So if there are different interpretations of the same evidence, that is what is to be expected, and this is how scholarship works. So just even if I have strong opinions on cer certain things, they have changed, they've grown over the decades that I'm looking into it, and I'm absolutely sure uh, mm -hmm. it will continue to be like that. And at uh, some point in the future, we may have more of a consensus than we have right now. But this is the exciting part of it. Yeah, we're actually at a place talking about the New Testament walking a path that hasn't been walked before. Uh, and it feels to those who are working in this particular field, like around Marcion in this edition, that we are really, um, we're on new ground. Uh, there are many reasons for that. The main reason is that New Testament scholarship is supposed to stick to the first century. And uh, church history scholarship is supposed not to mingle with the first century, but start in the second. And so there are actually rather few people who feel confident on both sides to share, share their information, their studies, uh, their scholarship, and be very, very clear and consinct about what we want to find out. Mm. My particular approach to the question is um, radical. I really want to follow the evidence. I, I've, I've found out that uh, especially faith communities reconstruct the story of where they come from and however it began in a very particular way, and uh, uh, and if you mingle with that, it won't listen to you. So it's not really a mystery that New Testament scholarship for the last 2,000 years was more interested in Jesus and whether Jesus was a Messiah and what our texts say about that than they were in the historical question. For, uh, that, of course, after so many people have written about the historical Jesus is, is a statement and uh, uh, that... Uh, yeah, I really have to explain. What do we have about Marcion, for example? Yeah, Marcion, we really have very bad sources. Mm -hmm. The main sources are, it's really Tertullian. And then we have uh, Clements of Alexandria and Irenaeus before that, and a few quotes in Justin Martyr. And then you're already, <laughs> there's not much there. So we really only have one particular date that, as I would call, an unreliable source that mm -hmm. Julian mentions. That's the year 144, in which Marcion was excommunicated from a congregation in Rome, which means that he was in Rome, 
mm -hmm. was part of a congregation. Uh, and the kind of orthodox congregation that Tertullian thinks was Christianity, who mm -hmm. writes about, uh, I mean, he, he, he writes 60, 70 years later. So if you imagine you would have to write, make a statement about something where you don't have a lot of written records of 70 years ago, whether they were a part of that church or not, even today that would be, so it's not a really good source. Mm -hmm. But this is typically <clears throat> the time that everyone uh, sort of works with. 144, so he couldn't really have been born before 70 and such and such. But for me, this is not a safe place to start. What is much clearer is that he had triggered a nerve. And mm -hmm. the, the writings that we have uh, by Tertullian, if I may just focus on this, because he wrote four books against Marxism, five books, sorry, mm -hmm. um, that the... Um, the Catholic Christian community that develops during the second century and that then becomes mainstream Christianity as we know it by developing that you have to be organized by a bishop, you have a, a Christian Bible, and there's a, a three part faith uh, a creed, a creed that they all agree on. It's just about God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the, and the congregation, the church. And that develops, is fully developed by the end of the second century. And he belongs to this movement and goes back to his beginnings. And in, in this context, he talks about Marcion. And what really, <clears throat> when he disagrees with what he calls Marcion, uh, hits all these points. His, mm -hmm. The Christology is different, but specifically, he's quoted as having a, a different, uh, what we would, what the Catholics call the New Testament. Yeah. and and by disagreeing with Marcion on this text, uh, he quotes it. So from these quotes and from his discussions is the only thing how we can reconstruct this book. There are people out there <clears throat> who might even think Marcion may just be someone he made up to have an enemy, you know, to tear down, <laughs> which, which we know happens. And also, in, if you think about polemics between main church and the Mormons or the or the, um, the Jehovah's Witnesses, or, so you don't get information. In the 16th century, you don't get good information on Catholics if you just read the polemics about them. So we have this kind of difficult sources to handle. And um, there have been really great attempts on reconstructing this text uh, during the last uh, few decades. Uh, Ulrich Schmidt did a fantastic work on finding the few things uh, that were different in the in, in Marcion's edition of the letters of Paul. It's only 10 letters instead of 14, so four of them is the letter to the Hebrews, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, go out the window immediately as later additions uh, to an older one and uh, to an older uh, edition of what Marcion probably called the New Testament. The title is probably from Marcion. I um, don't want to go into the reasoning too much, but uh, it's it's basically again Tertullian. He does not use the term New Testament when he talks about the Catholic Christian Bible. He only uses it when he has polemics against Marcion. So, hmm. so I have, it's little indications, but you know this is not it's not the kind of source historians really love. Um, when people fight each other and quarrel, they usually tend not to say the truth about the other person, but want to point out that they are right and nothing else. So this is a really wild situation, um, but reconstructing the text is not impossible. There are some very clear indications where, like Origen would say, well, the letter to the Romans in the Marcionite edition uh, stops with chapter 14. So the last two chapters, 15 and 16, are not there. I'm also a text critic. Um, mm -hmm. I'm one of the editors of the Greek New Testament, the Nestle Island edition. Yes, this is a, if you look at the manuscripts, you see that this is a complete chaos. You know, the last two chapters, uh, they're always there, but they have um, the variants that have survived in the copies show that there's something going on. There. So the doxology at the end sometimes shows up after chapter 14, sometimes chapter 15, sometimes chap after chapter 16. It's not a typical ending 
for a letter. It's a doxology, you know, God, mm. praise of God. And sometimes it's not there at all and, and such and such. So you, this is what you, you typically see in secular literature of antiquity when more than one edition uh, merges. Yeah, the scribes always want to have everything. Yeah? So they will copy all the variants of each of the editions they can get a hold of. And then it depends what they copy first, and you get the, exactly this kind of picture. So there are indications that uh, Origen actually saw the book, and re read it, and so on. The same is with Tertullian. But there, even there, we're not, we're not completely convinced whether he read it in Latin <laughs> or in Greek. Or as Marcus Vincent, for example, thinks it might have been a bilingual, yeah, that his, this edition was in two languages. For an historian, an exegete, this is a huge difference. If, you, if you're interpreting a bilingual, where the, uh, already the, those who produced the copy and those who are reading it already are aware that there are different, different variants, you know, mm -hmm. common variants, but these variants can be... It can be whole chapters. Yeah, uh, this is this is uh, this, this is a very different situation. Modern Bible readers always get uh, cleaned up English translation that made all these decisions for them. And if they have something that the NRSV or a little more scholarly things, they will have footnotes that say some manuscripts don't have this and that. Mm -hmm. For example, Jesus, Jesus, and the story of the. Uh, women caught in adultery is not in our Bibles anymore because the oldest manuscripts simply don't have it, you know? and and uh, and others. And but you still have it in translation with their brackets around it. Look it up. It's end of John seven if you're a Bible reader. And also the longer ending of Mark. Longer ending of Mark uh, and ending of uh, Romans sixteen. Mm -hmm. um, there are. The, Lot of pass there are quite a few passages that are substantial and change the meaning, but we can't quite decide uh, which is which is the earlier one. So we find the same situation uh, sometimes reflected what I call the canonical edition. With that I mean is exactly what American Bible translators will translate because we know what the New Testament looks like. It has twenty seven writings. It's four Gospels, fourteen letters of Paul. Right. Seven Catholic letters, uh, Acts, and, and Book of Revelation. So we know this is what I mean with canonical edition. Um, so now, getting getting back to to Marcion. So we have we don't have manuscripts, Marcionite manuscripts. We only have reconstructions of this text. And the big question is just the question you asked me: uh, Where's the hen and where's the egg? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is one uh, is is Marcionite edition is much shorter, ten letters of Paul, only one gospel, uh, doesn't have twenty seven writings, only eleven, and um, is this like um, you know they're just picking and choosing and taking the things that are nice and leaving out the other things that are tough, or is it the other way around that mm -hmm. the Marcionite edition was the first one? What we're reading in the New Testament, in the canonical edition of the New Testament, is an interpolated and enlarged edition. Interpolated meaning that uh, if there was a passage that they felt um, didn't represent their orthodox feelings about a certain topic, instead of deleting it or editing it, they would simply add. Hmm. As if you compare those two editions, they don't rewrite passages. It's one is simply shorter and the other one is longer. So, and this is the view that um, is now the one that is disturbing the industry, if you may say so, the New Testament scholarly community. These discussions were already um, held or were, were done in the 19th century. Uh, a lot of learned scholarship um, is, which is still available. And according to uh, Matthias Klinghardt, who is one of the who has also produced an edition of the of the Marcionite Gospel, uh, probably the most uh, twelve hundred pages. <clears> this <throat> says a lot. And the Marcionite Gospel is only about half the size of the Gospel of Luke. Yeah, so there's a lot. Uh, he really went to all the sources and reconstructed. So <clears throat> when um, when Mat Matthias Klinghardt uh, looks at it he, at the discussion, the scholarly discussion, 
he thinks that um, it was simply abandoned without ever finding closure. Hmm. The discussion whether Marcion was part of it. It's not like there is this book that has proved that Marcion could not be the predecessor. But at the same time, the, um, the two-source two theory that most people now... You know, so what is the two-source theory? One of the big exegetical questions we have when we look at the New Testament is the first three Gospels have so much text in common, mm. not just the same stories or so, but really literally the same phrases in Greek uh, organized in the same uh, arrangement, basically, you know, with a few changes. This is unprecedented. It's hard to look to find literature that is uh, literally so close to each other. So this problem of explaining why, how this comes, how this happens, is called the synoptic problem. Yeah, you you look them, put them next to each other, so synopsis, and then you look what the differences are, and you see that the differences are actually very meaningful. They're done on purpose, and this uh, intentional. Not they, they, it's not haphazard. It's, these are not independent sources. Yeah? And then the discussion is, well, who, who copies who, mm -hmm. or did they have a common source? Uh, and uh, in this direction, which Germans call literarkritik, and the Americans probably would call source criticism, is that that's, that's a synoptic problem. Um, much literature out there. And, and one answer is the two-source theory that thinks um, that uh, Matthew and Luke had Mark as one source, and then in addition, they had a second source, and that source is called Q, because it was German scholarship, and they're known for not being very imaginative, and Q is short for Quelle, for source. If you've been American Germans, so you would have called it the source S, source. Yeah. So it's Q, and um, that has dominated the discussion in the 20th century. The, the shortcoming of, of this is that um, you have to add a lot of uh, additional hypothesis to make Q work well. So some will say, uh, well, he didn't really copy Mark, but they copied an older Mark that we have lost. Yeah? It's not there anymore, and so on and so forth. And, and then it's not a two-source theory anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, from a theoretical point of view, a theory of how to do science and how to do scholarship, the more hypothesis you add, uh, the probability of your result being correct is it doesn't just it's not half as much, but it's only a quarter as much, and it's reduced to a level where. Well, let me see. I taught it, in, of course, at the university. Uh, you need to know about it, but if you then do the exercise in class, give me one observation. Let's say we discover one more observation that doesn't fit the two-source theory. You hard pressed. It's, it's such a wobbly thing where you can always add something, take something away, say, well, the text critical record is different. Or such. So if you, can, you cannot find an observation that can disrupt a theory and prove it wrong, then the theory in general is too general. I, then it's almost useless. Yeah? Um, and I'm not talking about New Testament scholarship. I mean, this is natural science. This is philosophy. This is any kind of of a search for knowledge that is based on dialogue and community of researchers will say, well, maybe we can find something better. Mm -hmm. And the most, the weakest part of the of Q is that we don't have a manuscript, that this ever was a source, that it was written down, that it was like a book with, you know, you can now find critical editions with chapters and verse numbers. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's wishful thinking. I mean. It could be. Scholarship is never about truth. Yeah, it is only on how what we can say through evidence and through discourse about what the most likely. It's always these are probability assessments. What's the most likely solution? So if you have to assume something that doesn't that you can't put your hands on, it's not. Uh, it will not survive very long if you have another option where you actually have a, uh, a record. You actually, you know, you know it existed. You have so many witnesses, this book existed. And this is what the Marcionite edition uh, is. 
we know that it existed. And we have so many quotes that when you look at Klinghardt's edition, for example, I mean, this, you can, almost every sentence you can put together you know, under certain methodological uh, pre, uh, preconditions. Um, I can give you the, the weakest point of Klinghardt and but the most reasonable one is, hmm. what with those passages they don't discuss, the enemies yeah, of Marcion? Well, he says, if they don't discuss it, they were literally the same. You know, so if Tertullian just jumps from one chapter to three chapters further, the two chapters in between had nothing that uh, raised his concern. Right? Mm -hmm. And this is what Klinghardt does, and this is why you can read it. So all those the places that are literal quotes will be printed in 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 bold no? and then you'll have discussion and such but if it's if it's not been questioned and it just simply assumes that both parties agreed on the same text this is not a necessary conclusion but it is also a reasonable one mm -hmm. and this is what scholarship does so we continue on this path and we we'll reconstruct it somehow so if you do it, um, uh, if, if you look at it this way, the 20th century, with holding on to the so two source theory, that was the main dogma, so to say, that was taught. And then starting in the 90s, uh, with, with Uli Schmidt and, and others, more and more felt uncomfortable. The big elephant in the room is Adolf, Adolf von Hanak, who, as a student, already won a prize for writing about Marcion. And kept to it all his life. He's really a brilliant scholar, but at the same time, uh, had uh, it was unclear what he really meant. Sometimes mm. he thought Marcin was older. Sometimes he thought Marcin was a reaction to the canonical edition. And so scholars were discouraged to have to take up a fight with a bit, the big elephant. Yeah, and that has my generation. We really don't. We have you know no bone in the. Uh, it was, we don't mind hurting the feelings of Hanak. Hanak, yeah, this is all over, and and so it started. Um, they started to point out that there are some real logical flaws, and that has never been disproven. And then all of a sudden, the fact that we have a real source makes the uh, source Q look really bad. Uh, hmm. Why would you have to reconstruct something if you can explain the same differences in the first three gospels and in, in, the, the literal things, but well, that's the book they quoted from. We have it, yeah. And the things that are different as redaction, as editorial changes, to to take old material and produce a certain message. What every pastor does on Sunday when they preach about a church, but, or what Book of Chronicles does as it rehearses the books of Kings and 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 and, and, and Samuel. What, familiar what editing means. Anyone who ever gotten a scholarly article in a peer-reviewed uh, journal will know that uh, you're talking to a lot of other people and there are certain agendas that have to be followed to be published in this book for this audience. Right. Like, I, I would expect you would have everyone on your po po podcast. You, you also make your choice who you want to listen to. Users definitely turn off if they're not interested. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, so and this is, uh, I think, the most important thing one, one should know about um, the Marcion edition, that this is a new thing. It's not completely, it's not finished. And the really big names, which is interesting enough, no? like, like Baidun and, and Roth and, and Klinghardt and, and Vincent's, uh, have worked independently of each other and came to the same solutions that uh, mm. you cannot... You must accept that Marcin is older. If you turn around, it doesn't make any sense. Hoffman is another one who, who broke the ice in, um, yeah, in the, already in the 20th century. And, uh, but if now we, we look each other in the eye you know, <laughs> and see each other and find we come to the same solution. We, we, we did it very differently. We completely disagree on each other's methodolo methodology or not completely. But so... So this is the situation. My take, I've been sometimes qualified as a revisionist, yeah, someone who just, I'm from Missouri, show me. Yeah, my mother was born in Missouri. Uh, I have no, I've never worked for a church. Um, I've worked for universities, but also there for Germany and 
United States and taught um, for more than 20 years at different institutions, I never had to bend my my methods or my view to my employer. Uh, and although the Germans wanted me to, to talk about uh, Lutheran theology, um, I didn't feel that, you know, I don't need to talk about Paul's reception of Lutheranism. Uh, it's mm. the other way around, yeah. And so this is always a love-hate relationship between systematic theologians and exegetes. And, but I always felt I could, I could follow the path that made sense to me. And for me, it made sense to begin with the evidence. I'm back again where I started. Yeah? And the evidence is blurry. Um, you have to really be careful what you pick to start out to build a theory. Um, and uh, my big, big, absolute, big insight was when, as a text critic, um, I'm, of course, look at and study and enjoy uh, the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament. And I became a specialist in this. I was published several books just on the manuscripts of the New Testament. And the absolute striking observation, and no one, I wasn't aware where no one talks about it, is that clearly if you have a writing of 27 books, and it's, it's like that in all the manuscripts, and we have about 6,000 manuscripts, I mean, that's it, it's not complete. These 6,000 are not complete uh, with 27 writings, but they always have one volume. The New Testament has four volumes. One volume is called the Tetra Evangelion, the four gospel book, which already will throw up like 90% of all commentaries ever written. If they write a commentary on Matthew, they, they is this Matthew actually exists? What did the Matthean community look like? Yeah, what were, oh, yeah, 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 Luke, this was the, you know, Jewish, Hellenist. Uh, uh, Matthew was probably more like a, a more traditional Judaizer. So, so. Why, why did you come up with something like that? You have a four gospel book. That means everyone who read Matthew also read John and Luke and Mark. So if you want to talk about the genre, don't talk about single gospels. Why, how, why do you say that? Okay. Well, because it says it. Gospel according to Matthew. Gospel is a term that's never been used for uh, a genre before. To, to, it, gospel means just good news or, yes, marathon, the Battle of Marathon. He runs back. We won, we won the battle. That's called Oyangelion. Yeah? Good, yeah, good news. Yeah, well, we're missing on the internet, basically. <laughs> and the uh, uh, gospel according to Titles of books are usually, like we do, we would call it the Gospel of Matthew. Yeah, they have this choice, and this is the typical title. You, you, you read something not according to Aristotelus, but by Aristotelus. You're doing it, but why according to? This is unusual. Would two editors independently of each other choose such a title? And then Matthew is not mentioned in the book as the author. He shows up as one of the characters. But that he should be the writer is quite a statement. Would two independent things uh, really think? Uh, and, and why Matthew? Wouldn't be Peter better? Or you know, a guy who's a little more important than Mark? The same thing. Mark is not, word Mark is not used in this gospel. So someone who calls a gospel according to Mark made a very editorial decision. We continue with Luke is not mentioned there in order to find out who Luke is. But now comes that. In order to find out who Mark is. You also have to read the Mark is mentioned in, in, in Acts of the Apostles, mentioned in First Peter, as this, as this is my son Mark. And so, mm -hmm. uh, well, and then you all of a sudden get this idea that Mark, this might actually be the Gospel of Peter, and Mark just wrote it down, which is Tertullian, Irenaeus, all those people who hate, hate Marcion have, for some reason, the same provenance record. Mark wrote it in the first, it was disappeared. Now it shows up again. And we're, we're giving it you, this is a new publication, yeah? Second century, we've, it, the church has taken care of it, miraculously preserved it. And others, record Marcion is just absolute humbug. He has really bad manuscripts. He only has 14 chapters in Romans. Yeah? You, you, you know, so this is how it works. So people who saw the New Testament in the second century, and saw the Marcionite edition uh, had a real problem. It it, it really it hit the nerve. Yeah? And so this is, and, and those are the writers that 
that we have. So, but to finish, the, my, my big insight was there's actually an editorial level to the New Testament that was, I felt, unexpected. For example, the observation that Acts is always, it always introduces the Catholic epistles of you know, uh, James, Peter, John, Jude. It's not like we read many uh, editions that you have Paul after Acts and then comes. The, the, up to the ninth century, all manuscripts are, the same, are that way. Also, uh, the Orthodox Bibles, many Russians, uh, Russian, uh, Greek Orthodox and, and Church Slavonic, they all follow, follow this sequence. Also, the first editions, uh, Westcott and Hort, uh, the first printed editions that had real impact followed that sequence. But the first printed editions in the 16th century uh, done by Stephanus and others, copied manuscripts, rather late manuscripts from the Byzantine era. And there the bishops had decided that for purposes, probably for purposes of reading, of having the, the lectionary readings every Sunday, it would be better to have Paul before the others. No? Hmm. And so they organized for their particular region this, this, this new uh, and later um, uh, arrangement. and. Um, Erasmus just happens. He was a lazy guy. He, he went into the uh, library in Basel and just picked seven, seven, eight manuscripts. And that's he didn't even copy. He didn't even copy them by hand. He just made editorial notes in the margins for the typesetter. And the typesetter wasn't really good at reading Greek. And and so, so the first printed edition of the Greek New Testament you won't get old of it because they had to immediately uh, replace it with another one. Yeah. They had too many mistakes on every page. Tens, 10, 20 mistakes. It was useless. And so, but it is the arrangement that comes through this first printed edition of Erasmus into the King James translation, into the Martin Luther translation in German, and has defined ours. The next edition of the Greek New Testament probably correct that because that's the history of critical editions that they go back to the manuscripts. And the more manuscripts you find, the older they are, the better the text is. Those readings have to be put in there. And from those critical editions of the Greek text, all translations uh, in the world are made. So going back, there is an editorial frame of the New Testament that cannot be denied, but has never been taken seriously. Hmm. Someone must have done that. Uh -huh. And that person did not live in the first century. And so there was a, that was my first, first book came out in Oxford. University Press, the first edition of the New Testament. And the, there was an editorial in the Frankfurt uh, Allgemeine Zeitung, a leading daily paper about this book when it came out, and it said, ah, the Holy Spirit is now out of a job. <laughs> because if this is a real person, then, you know, much of the kind of inspirational myths around every word is inspired, it's dictated by God or so, goes out of the window. It's very likely, like, like you and me or any other one, that when we experience religion and uh, participate in communities, that, uh, that we have our own uh, agenda that is informed by what's good and what's bad in our own, uh, our, our, our own community. Yeah? And if, you know, I also gave courses at very liberal uh, liberal churches, where it's almost if you weren't tra transgendered, you couldn't really be a member of them. Yeah, it's, it's very extreme. And then you have feminists and you have others who are just as extreme in their conservative view. As a New Testament scholar, I'm always, it's all right because I'm about the New Testament. I didn't write it, it's not my fault what's in there. But when you look at the New Testament, you realize the way we read it, the canonical edition, that there are social issues that we don't agree with anymore. One of them is the treatment of women. Uh, women should not have leadership in congregations. Uh, another is a, clearly a homophobic tendency that we think we've gotten over that. You know, when I'm talking about Europe now, not so much about North America. We are still in the process, but last 20 years is very clear that it's not an issue even for churchgoers anymore. So that you know, Church Church W. Bush could do his his campaigning for his second term uh, by talking to 
evangelical congregations about homosexuality, it's not imaginable anymore. It's, it's not a topic. Young people are not interested in it. What I'm trying to say is we have our own agendas. As we travel between cultures, we find out that they're not everyone is, belongs to the same, has the same feelings about what's right and wrong. And historically, this is also true for the, for the first century and for the second century. And there are other cultural markers come in that have never taken seriously in, 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 in uh, uh, New Testament scholarship, the most obvious one. It's, it's so obvious that we don't see it anymore, that this is written in Greek. Jesus didn't, when he spoke to, to the peasants, or to, his words on the, he, he didn't speak Greek yet. Very clearly, we've already shifted to a completely different uh, group. Yeah, these are not fishermen reading. These are very educated people who can read, or very educated, educated enough that they can read, that they appreciate a Greek text, and they, they're not going to live where Jesus lived. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty obvious as well. And then you look at, yeah, well, the letters are all written in Asia Minor or Rome. Or so. This is what this is where this book comes from. The center of Christianity in the beginning of the second century or so was not neither Asia Minor nor Rome, it was Egypt. Egypt is not, it's not a topic in this. So you see the, once you realize that there are certain people who must have done it, you actually have handles to place them by looking at what is important to them as far as society is concerned, I come social issues, what I like to call them. Um, and they represent their readership. The readers didn't want to have women. Yeah, no, That's not what I wanted to say. What I wanted to say is that the discussion of women leadership was there. And you have the one group who says, I think this is wrong. Yeah, Why do they think it is? Because it happened. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So obviously you have another group where it happened and they had women leadership. The Montanists, the movement, second century. Tertullian in his old days becomes a Montanist, was led by two women, two prophetesses. Um, although he writes in his early days that women cannot, uh, you know, and such and such. So, so now you, have, you get these handles about placing it. And it seems a publication that was designed from the beginning for actually a rather large uh, audience. People in Asia Minor would have loved to read it, which is Asia Minor and, and Greece are where most of the um, the writings refer to, and of course, Rome as well. And then the story of Jesus is also placed uh, in this context with, it's clearest it's in Luke, which, you know, who was the emperor at the time, yeah, when Jesus was born. That's a Roman perspective. And goes through the book of Acts and ends again in Rome before Paul dies. And so the last sentence is Paul is in Rome, lives there for two years, but he's still alive. The, so all of this was uh, just, I found, mind-blowing. And, and that was uh, the first edition of the New Testament. It was a book 30 years ago. And that book had a, had a, it was, a, it was handed in to the University of, of Heidelberg as a Habilitationsschrift. In the German system, you have to produce two dissertations, basically. And they should be about different topics on the same, of the same, um, discipline. So the dissertation was about Paul and my habilitation was the first edition of the New Testament. So moving away 100 years yeah, from the other topic and so looking at it. And the third part was about delving into how could you still reconstruct when this happened and who was involved and, um, and why are they lying, say it bluntly, because they, they really don't know. I mean, the first John is, John is never mentioned. Yeah. Um, well, you can get away with it. You thought about it and you made a mistake or so. But if first, second Timothy was added, no, these letters look like they are or, original letters. Yeah. Uh, end of Galatians, I'm, look at how, uh, in end of Galatians, I write with really large letters. Yeah. You, this indicates that's the publisher that I'm looking for. Yeah. Who could have published that? Uh, must have had access, either had access to the original, because this handwritten thing is only in one copy. It's in the one copy that was in the mail. You don't keep copies of handwritten. You know, this was an authentication, like a signature. 
um, or end of Thessalonians, I finish all my letters with my own hand. And this is how I write hutos grapho. So here, look, this works best if it only works. Oh, let me see. The publisher signals that he has an authentic letter. These passages um, uh, are there to authenticate. And then you continue to look at it and you see, oh, this is actually a common theme. All of these are genuine books. Most churchgoers will think, you know, when you say gospel, gospel, Matthew's gospel is not written by Matthew, why? So, well, look up any introduction to the New Testament, you'll find out that the consensus is that with the exception of maybe six letters of Paul, none of the writings were written by the people that are associated with. Really? You say, oh, they, they also don't know if they're not written by that, but it's, there's no, no indication that it could be. And they can give you their arguments, yeah, uh, why this is so. And if you read Moby Dick or you call me Ishmael, he's lying to you in the first sentence. He tells you already that he's not going to give you his real name. And you still enjoy reading it because it's literature. So lying is not the right term. Yeah? It's a literary device. You create authority by using big names. Um, but you also know it's not, not genuine. Harry Potter is like that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. you, you, you already know you live in a world that is different, but still you wouldn't forgive them if they had inconsistencies as they relate to each other. So, you know, if the, the age isn't the right one, in one, it's right in one chapter, it's wrong in the other, you can't do that. So it's called editing. Yeah? The editors pick that up. So uh, this editorial frame in, indicates, and this is now the second book that I wrote about it because I thought, if you point out that there's this editorial frame, and it has been very acceptable, uh, the term canonical edition is now used by many, it didn't exist before, and their uh, dictionary articles are so who just assume now everyone knows that the New Testament was broken up in four volumes and is a, a part of the final editorial frame. Now, no one knew that 30 years ago. This was, but the consequences have never really been drawn. So the third part of my, um, my habilitation that I handed in was following those lines. And I had my working title was the New Testament is forgery. And the, 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 the colleagues at the, I was, had already been teaching there for 10 years as an assistant professor, uh, told me they, they're not going, they're not even going to, no matter what's in that book, with, with a title like that, you'll never, we'll never pass you through this second dissertation. You don't get a grade for the habilitation, but they have to say, yeah, you're really, you could be a professor among us. Huh? And I say, we, you can't. Huh? So I was advised not to, to hand it in, and I didn't. And so the last 30 years, I had the chance of watching other scholarship and seeing what emerges and found out that uh, now we know a lot more, and I'm so happy I didn't hand it in at the time. And that's, the, that's this other book. Trying to find out more who did it and why. And in this context, of course, the observation that there was a Marcionite edition is absolutely essential because it gives you one of those markers. Uh, those who put the canonical edition of the New Testament together uh, hated Marcion. Yeah? So if you find an anti Marcionite tendencies in it, it shouldn't be a surprise. I'll give you an example. Uh, the Book of Acts, which is clearly not in the Marcionite edition, if you look at it from that perspective, was added by those who put the canonical edition together. They added to Marcion's gospel, three more, and they interpolated as they enlarged the gospel of Marcion by about 30% of texts. So, um, and then uh, the Book of Acts has absolutely no precedence. It's never quoted before, 150, before Irenaeus, who writes around 180. So even if you're conservative, you can say maybe 150. You have no records of it. So no one can prove. The discussions that you see among your colleagues, was it in the 90s, was it in the 70s? It's, it's so ridiculous. If you go at it as a text critic from the manuscripts to the fact, you have nothing, not even a quote or so before that. So if you look at it the way I do, that this is actually put in at the time that the final edition, that the canonical edition was put together, it all falls into place because the book of Acts actually, by linking it to the four gospel book, 
Trulup and the same author, says we belong together. So these two volumes might be separate, uh, the Pax Apostles, which is Acts, it's Catholic letters, but it is connected. Then you look at the contents. One of the issues the critics have with Marcion is that he believes in Paul. So he believes in Christ, but not in Jesus. That's a blunt way of saying it. But Christ is accessible to the readers, to everyone forever, where Jesus was just accessible to the eyewitnesses. So by, by being, it's not even clear that Marcion wanted to say that, but it's clear that he was, understand, was understood that way. Um, so they want to make sure that that doesn't work. You cannot have Marcion playing out against the other 12 disciples, yeah? and especially not the leadership. You know? So, so <laughs> the first letter in the Marcionite edition was the letter of Paul to the Galatians, which describes in the second chapter uh, the big discussion between Peter and Paul. And uh, Paul gets up and just in front of the whole congregation tells him that he's not a good, good Christian. Yeah. So look for details. It's about circum circumcision and and dietary rules and these kind of things. This matter. But this is, well, that's not what we want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> um, the canonical edition tries to put Peter and Paul together to fix this conflict. This is one way of looking at it. And if you if you accept that, just really accepted by almost everyone, yeah? it's, um, uh, you realize that the first part of Acts is about Jerusalem. And it's exactly James, Peter, and John, and the brothers of Jesus who are leading the congregation. It is followed by Catholic epistles who have the letters of James, Peter, and John, and Judas, the brother of Jesus. And the, until the half of it, the second half is completely dominated by Paul. And right in the middle, chapter 15, they both shake hands. In, to meet in Jerusalem and to, oh, it's all a misunderstanding. We're really all in the same program. And we write this letter. And, and um, it couldn't be a more anti marcionite position could not be formulated if, if you tried as hard as you could. Yeah, <laughs> so this, the point of this story may not mean anything to us at all because we are not involved in these discussions. We're involved in feminist this, Discussions were involved in uh, upcoming uh, uh, elections in the U.S. We're involved with uh, all kinds of other issues that we are, Israel and the war in Israel at the moment, uh, that are very pressing to us. And if we'd have to edit the Bible today, we might want to mm -hmm, get our, our point of view in there if we had a chance somehow. It's not just that we could, we actually do. If you look at your Bibles, it depends who, if it's Tyndale or if it's a, a Bible society, whoever printed it, the ones will be very reluctant to give you, uh, they would just want to provide you text by other editions like uh, New Testament for men, the New Testament for women, the New Testament for such and such. They clearly don't want to give you just text. Yeah, absolutely. So all the editions will reflect that. That's what we're seeing there as well in a completely different time with conflicts that are not our conflicts today between. Peter and Paul is not really a problem. Yeah, I mean, it is a problem in our heads. Yeah, when we read this text, but it is not a, a political problem. Of uh, if you believe that Paul was wrong, you can't be a Lutheran. No, it's not. not it's not like that. It doesn't, it doesn't have that. Um, so this is uh, um, yeah. This is what we what we see in the second century with these editorial these editors that one of the points where you can place them historically is anti-Marcionite. I gave you just one that uh, acts as an example, but you can do this with uh, the additions to the Gospel of Marcion uh, to make it the Gospel of Luke, beginning with the first sentences. I'm Luke writing this, and they look at the others. Yeah, Well, it's already the third Gospel. You know exactly which others he looked like. So the question that we started out with, with the synoptic problem, why does why do they have so much text in common? Well, he tells you. He read them, yeah? And then he, he criticizes, ah, oh, yeah, but it's, you know, so disorganized. So I went back, I looked at everything. I, he's not an eyewitness. I interviewed eyewitnesses. I spoke to servants of the word, as he calls, ministers, people who preach, who've seen Jesus probably in such and such. 
and some are really, I, I put them in good order. I always think it must have been a German yeah, the order. And we have this Gospel of Mark, which is absolute disaster if you want to <laughs> make a timeline or so. Jesus just goes on, speaks, and goes over the water and back, and it's not like a day or a tick or weeks or years. You really don't know anything about it. So one of the um, big shots in New Testament discipline, probably 100 years ago, he said, well, it's, it's a passion story. It's, Mark is a passion story. As soon as Jesus goes into Jerusalem, the time ticks from Palm Sunday to his death, we will know every day where he was, where he slept with such and such. So he said one way of looking at Mark is it's a passion story with a very long introduction. Yeah, so, yeah that's how Luke feels about it. And Luke being uh, the invent, the, not the invented, the implied author. Let's put it this way. It's, it's Moby Dick. Yeah? Uh, call me Ishmael. Call me Luke. Yeah? It's the implied author of this, and he went back to it. And he's a great historian. He checked all his records. Well, and then he starts with, uh, uh, with the shepherds in the field and the angels coming down and what they say and what the vision is. This, this is not a historical record at all. Yeah? Why, why, don't, why don't people just... Uh, say where well, here's someone taking a lot of poetic license and he's not even living up to it. Is this ironical? Is he just trying to make fun? Yeah, irony is when you say exactly the opposite of what you mean. Yeah? And and then it starts where Marcion's gospel starts. Uh, it starts with Jesus going down to Capernaum. Yeah? Uh, uh, and at that point, yeah, uh, uh, you're already through a lot of. Uh, of jungle and of stories that make a lot of sense in the second century. So, in this, the way I try to approach the question about the origins of the of Christian scripture in the book was first not repeating what I found out with the manuscript, but saying this is undebatable. It is like that. The New Testament is published in four volumes. There's an editorial frame. Someone must have done it. But let's continue. And the next is, well, what do the, the, how can, you know, if you want to date something, a writing in, in, uh, of antiquity, you have to be aware where the manuscripts are. If you have a manuscript from the second century, it clearly was not written in the fourth century. Yeah. But manuscripts are not enough. With Aristotle, you end up in the 10th century AD, but this is a writing, <laughs> these are writings from, um, uh, yeah, fourth, fourth century. The third century BD, uh, uh, BC, you know, so. and um, the second is you try to identify the first uh, documented readers. If someone really, and I'm not meaning quoting a verse from the Old Testament, it must have been a Christian. Nah, no, no, it must have referred to the editorial frame. Call the quote something, and call it. This is from Gospel of Matthew, huh? Gospel according to Matthew. This is then I know. This, this writing had already existed. The New Testament already existed at that time. And then uh, that's what I did. And you, as I told you at the beginning, Tertullian, Irenaeus, and such and such. You can't go further back than 150, if you even Papias, some, some date him to 110, uh, uh, but only some. This is not clear at all when he lived. And with the companions he's referring to, is, uh, there are also dates that place him around 150. So I'm looking for safe points to start, not for, for what the tradition has always used. To say. I, don't, I couldn't care less about that. If it was wrong, it's wrong. It's still wrong. We don't know. We simply don't know, and we shouldn't be ashamed of saying what we don't know. And so you end up in the second part of the second century, where both the oldest fragments are people who want to date them there, like P, um, P46, around 200, P52, is now dated uh, between second or third century. It used to be the oldest fragment, 125. That's complete humbug. Go on website of Manchester, um, uh, uh, where, where, where they're kept, and look at what, what modern scholarship is. And so this, we, we cannot date a, a fragment to a year 125. That's ridiculous. As a, yeah. So, but you end up there. And then the third part was, if this has actually happened in the second century, um, shouldn't we look at other books on Jesus of the second century? 
I said, shut it out. My discipline was completely hung up. No, if it's not, it's not first century, don't bother. Yeah. And there you find out that there are 50, 60 gospel books out there. Yeah. So um, that uh, some of them can very comfortably be dated into the second century, for example, Gospel of Mary, because the oldest fragments are from the second century. You can move around. With literature, it's always hard to, literature is to a general public and often doesn't want to be dated as, as a fact. But if you have a copy, this is pretty good. If Irenaeus talks about the four Gospels and has an explanation, yeah, they're like four winds, they're four directions, you know he had four Gospels. And if he if calls him a Gospel of Matthew, Mark, you know, it's we're looking at the same thing. What's interesting to me was that independent of the New Testament is that there's also a providence narrative. I worked for museums um, as a consultant and for collectors. And uh, for legal purposes, um, there's a lot of crime going on in this area. You ask, always ask for provenance records. So can you show me the when you bought this manuscript, from whom? Do you still have the original receipt? And is this a provenance record? And they all have the same stories that uh, um, you know, Matthew, uh, Mark was in Egypt, and Matthew did it this and did for that reason. And then they go through the authors and how it came together. Really wild, yeah? So you think that whoever put that out also put out a, some kind of a PR press release, uh, why this is so important. And it helps you understand uh, the mindset of the editors and how they thought their, what would be convincing for their readership. And so you get a beautiful, valuable I, I, a record for a second century Christianity. But you also get a comparison with other books. And you find out there are so many, the uh, Gospel of Valentinian, Gospel of Thomas, yeah, they, they, they belong to that period. And none of them, the, the historians say this are useless for historical purposes. Yeah. They are just, uh, some of them are just making up what they need. So they're solving problems of the second century by using voices of the first century. Yeah? This is basically their, uh, one of their methods. And then at the end, you wonder, well, why of all these should just the four gospel book be the one that has reliable information? And, and you can go to Josephus and check it, but with the others, you can. You must say that the genre does not allow this conclusion. The genre, the, you know, when, when uh, Bush, uh, let's say, Trump met Putin, yeah? Well, if it begins like that, you really want to know, is this a joke? Or is this a headline from the New York Times? So genre is extremely important for you then to continue to understand what comes. And if the genre is so full of poetic license, yeah? And uh, it's just refer references a certain number of the same actors, like the 12 disciples. You have gospel almost about every, each single one of them. Yeah, uh, You have so many writings of John in the second century. Of, uh, and they're typically, you know, the Nakamada Library was a huge f uh, find. The translators have sometimes made it so complicated to understand. Yeah. Uh, the discourse of Seth, the number two, who's going to look at it? And then you start reading it and you say, oh, I'm Christ, I'm telling you what really happened. I understand that. Yeah, I was up there in heaven. In first person singular, Christ tells you what happened, yeah? why he was sent out, what happened. Down. And then I went, there was a, a guy and I got into his body and put on his, his skin and, and, and walked there. And I don't know, was the other dead? I, I, you don't, it's like an alien, yeah? And then he goes through, and when he's in the cross, that's the same same book. When he's on the cross, and uh, he laughs at them. Don't they know that they can't kill me? And he goes back to Father. So you have the same storyline that all these gospels share some kind of a meta narrative that there are gods in heaven, a pantheon usually, and one of them in, in the Catholic uh, dialect, it's one God only as one son. In others, it's not the sometimes through against resistance and uh, he has to he comes down on earth and tells them what people have to do um, who you know people used to be in heaven and then this bad things happen the demiurge the world creation is bad creation is not good uh, it's not the Catholic necessarily 
but there is this under God yeah, um, who, who just messed up creation. This can all be fixed if you follow what the good news is about. And then you go back and then Jesus goes back, to Christ goes back up to heaven and now you can experience it. This is the meta narrative that they all share. And then all of a sudden you think maybe we should be more careful. Yeah? It, the historical value of these sources, it, 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 although we wish it was there, and it, very clearly they go to long lengths to give you the original autographs of Paul in order to make their point, yeah, as basically they're forging documents and publishing them and with the saying, well, we had them, yeah? it's like the Hitler diaries. Um, then the, the um, uh, uh, you shouldn't, you are not well advised to think that this is historical information that you're going to get about Pilate. Yeah? You probably just pulled it out of something where Pilate was mentioned. And they say, but Josephus already, no, Josephus proves in this nothing. All it proves is that those who are supposed to read this also knew Josephus. That's all it proves. So if there is a, if they count the, you know, in the beginning of Luke, um, if, with the census, the story of the census, yeah, that's in, that's in, in Josephus, right? That's a completely different time. It's absolutely misreading. Whoever was trying to pull in Josephus did not, uh, Read it very carefully. Also, when you read Josephus, uh, John the Baptist is well and alive long after Jesus died. Yeah, um, it's a little unclear in Josephus. You can go this and that way, but it's clear where the editors went. Yeah, so you have indications like that where Josephus is an important record, but only to show what the what the readings and misreadings of the Catholic Christian community was at the end of the second century. That's the only value it has. It doesn't prove anything. It, it will try not to write anything that. Josephus clearly would have disproved, but they're not, not, not all that good at it, really. They're also not all that good at editing. They come back to a book of Acts, which is a problem for interpreters. If you have editors that are very, very strict and you can clearly understand what they're about, it is easier to understand which passages they really love from the tradition, which others might have been added just to clarify <laughs> what's right and what's wrong. It's not quite as easy because with, with, uh, with editors who are over their head, who are really not all that good. Book of Acts, yeah. You ask someone, why, why, when did Paul get his name? When did Saul turn into Paul? You say, well, clearly when he had his conversion. You say, no, just go and read it. He's called Saul for chapters after that. And then it's just uh, uh, Paul, who is also called Saul and continues, there's no reason, there's no event, there's absolutely nothing that explains that to you. If you tried to get that through the editors of Fortress Press, they would say, David, all right, just make up your mind, wouldn't it be better? So, or the vision of Paul, sometimes everyone hears the voice, sometimes no one hears the voice, sometimes you see they do. You, you tell it three times in the same book, please just clean up your act, do that. And, they're more than, uh, I did that just with students reading the English Bible once for a class exercise up to next week. Everyone has to find one of these things. Uh, Dear Bible Society, I have this wonderful book here about the first uh, apostles, and I would like you to publish it. Uh, any suggestions? And you write suggestions. And no one was allowed to repeat the suggestion someone else had already posted. Yeah? They came up with more than 40, like, you know, on that level. They really think... Um, no, this book would not pass modern standards, but also not ancient standards. We have very well written books in the second century. The, the example, the, the 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 story of Alexander the Great by Arianus in the second century. It's completely the same period. Very well crafted, very well designed. If he has sources that don't agree with each other, he'll write them all out and give his own opinion. It's this, this is scholarly. You can trust his sources because some of them we are recorded in different ways. Those quotes are literal, are, are very great. New Testament, you don't have any like that. You have, ah, I wrote this with my own hand, yeah. That kind of uh, historical, it's a different genre. It's, it's, it's Harry Potter for Christians, you know, so something like that. So what is the historical value of that? Is it describes the time when the Christian, the Catholic Christian movement evolved. It also clearly documents what they didn't like about, about the other movements that also called themselves Christians. Christologically, they do not, they, they don't want to have a second God, uh, a lesser God, you know, who's 
who's uh, in charge of all evil things. Um, they didn't listen to the mid, uh, Midwest Christians uh, because they believe in the devil. Uh, everything that's bad is the devil. The devil is introduced at some point, you know, in the tradition between the oldest. The Old Testament doesn't need it for a long time. It comes up at the end with the book of Job and Maccabees and so. But before that, God did the, the good and the bad. Yeah, God was absolute. You couldn't, you couldn't trust him in the sense but because you couldn't criticize him. He did what he wanted. He made the law and broke it at the same time, and th that's okay. Yeah. But then you, uh, God becomes the good uh, after the exile, probably with so through Zoroastrian so schism that invents this bad God. Uh, in the exile, they would have been exposed to this kind of thinking. And after the writings that are written during that period and afterwards may have introduced, we don't know. At the time of the New Testament, the Greek people reading it, or the audience already ex explained, uh, they believe that there is a devil and um, yeah, leave you with that. But other Christian uh, communities believe it even stronger and have uh, stronger, better names for that. Um, and so this is, uh, um, this is uh, the outcome of, of the thing. We can say more than I could 30 years ago about who was probably involved. It is clearly, it is very clear that the discussion around the Marcionite edition is a very essential one because you can establish what they added, uh, what they changed. And that, of course, always the editorial perspective gives you an insight into the soul of those people. Um, it, this is not a negative take on the New Testament. Uh, it can easily be constructed like that, you know, people who don't want to uh, look for things that are bad about an author will always pick, find, find something, and they're usually right. Yeah, this is not the question. But it is, I'm trying to advocate it that the uh, New Testament is a, is a product of world literature. It has had an enormous impact over the years uh, and, and still has. It is very meaningful to readers, just like Harry Potter. They don't sit down, did this really happen? It's, it's, it's the least important question. <laughs> and it's, it's, it helps us reflect our own, for people who have spiritual experiences and don't, uh, don't want to deny them, you know. On top of the mountain, they look down and they just think it's so beautiful. Yeah, it's just apps. I'm so thankful. Well, who are you thankful? I don't really know. You know, but this is something that transcends our own existence. We know we don't live forever. We're going to die at some point. But there is something that is bigger than us that we share with people who are already dead. Yeah, and and that's how I. That's what I'm trying to talk about. And if you have openness for that realm, this is a great text. Mm -hmm. And it's always served that purpose. It's also served communities to, to find words, and find language uh, to express how they feel about social issues. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's, that's what I mean. That's social, yeah. Uh, Christianity, uh, any religion cannot, uh, religion cannot exist if you sit alone in a room. You, you know, you have to, you need someone to talk about about this, that you're probably not really able to discern what God is and what God isn't. It's also clear, yeah. But for your community, you may be able to express yourself because they let you get away with a lot. <laughs> because they share, yeah, a Catholic, marry a virgin who gave birth and had four more kids. Really? Really? Yeah. But if you share that, you're absolutely happy with, with, with uh, seeing her as the you know, the maid who's given everything she has to her God and you repeat her prayer and, uh, from the Gospel of Luke or so, which is an addition here, and um, such and such. Why not? So that's the end end of, of what I'm trying to say. I don't want to destroy the New Testament. I just want people, agnostics, faithful, scholars, literary, critical, uh, uh, literary scholars, yeah, to appreciate it. Uh, this is what it is. Don't, don't, don't make it a book about history. It's it's as ridiculous as saying the world was created in seven days when you just have a myth. When you just have this beautiful story about why God had to rest on the 
you know, why do we, why, why don't we work on Sundays? Well, you know, God had so much work for six days, and the seventh day he rested, and he rests in Hebrew is Shabbat. Huh? So that's why how the Sabbat came. Why do we have so many languages? Well, you know, they built this huge tower and it made God angry and such. And this is where the languages come from. Where does the wine come? It could go on and on and on. And so the New Testament is a story about where does Christ come from. And the first lines of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, is Biblos, Genesios, Jesu, Christu. Biblos, book. Oh, yeah, but I'm having a book. Yeah, right. Uh, Genesios. Oh, Genesis. That's, is that a reference to the first book? Uh, it, uh, literature <laughs> is playful. It has connotations on many different things. Uh, it could be historical. Maybe the author itself didn't know. Maybe the editor didn't know. Maybe they just loved it. But it also means Genesis, like in English, you know, something that develops. Yeah? So maybe the, it should be called the book about how Jesus became Christ, the development of Jesus Christ. Yeah? And that would definitely describe exactly what the New Testament is about. It tells you where Christ comes from in this playful, Harry Potter-like, uh, literary, mythical stories about early apostles. But don't make it a history book. It never wanted to be one. I mean, it should never be. I say that. I'm trained as a historical critical scholar. So for me, this is not, it throws out 80% of my education. Yeah. Huh? It places what I learned historically, critically. You say, all these methods are correct, but you need to be sure that it fits the time and the place where this thing was written and published. So other way to say historic criticism is absolutely okay, but just take it seriously as a, as a, as a product of the second century and then be more reasonable. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the double tradition material in Matthew and Luke, which scholars believe came from the hypothetical Q document. But you look at Marcion's gospel, you're saying that Matthew and Luke got their double tradition material from Marcion. Now you pointed out that Luke also says that he utilized sources, um, documents prior to him. Well, I can stop you right there. Okay. But what is different is... Um, falling into the trap that Matthew and Luke and John are different people. Yeah? Okay. And this is not a necessity. The reason for that is simply the form critical analysis of comparable literature. And if someone writes, uh, they say, I, Christ, wrote this book, my story, something like that, you, you clearly know that you cannot deal with them in, in an author in the sense and separate them. So you would have to, if we knew, if, if we could just for a moment forget all the valuable and great historical scholarship that the New Testament discipline is built on, just for a moment, and say we didn't know anything about that, you would assume that someone sits down and says, I'm going to take the, the, the persona of Matthew. I'm doing this Moby Dick thing. And this is why I call it according to. Yeah? Gospel according to Matthew is not the same as a gospel written by Matthew. And I'll just, uh, because I've been a teacher, um, university, you know, most of my life, I, I make this a writing assignment for next, next, uh, next class we meet. Please, all right, uh, from the perspective of Matthew. Yeah? Uh, let's take one scene, right? so, you know, the, the healing of the... Uh, healing of, of, of someone who can't walk anymore yeah just do this you have just right from perspective of matthew you could do that anytime mm -hmm. gospel according to what is it garth or whatever uh, mm -hmm. or uh, there are very very famous examples uh, also at our present time where this is done this exercise where they simply do according to and they imagine imaginary character this is what the genre is about if they have a gospel of mary magdalene it's not that mary magdalene wrote it it is just that someone is telling the story from the perspective. There's no, not a, not a really a mystery that Mary will bring up. Well, he liked me, he spoke to me, and then Peter answers, says, "Well, well, what did he say to you? Well, he spoke to you as well in private, didn't he? Gospel say that they spoke to him private. Yeah. So what did he say to you? Well, the other day, you know, when I slept, I saw Jesus and he came and he talked to me. Ah, that's a vision." 
Yeah, if you have a vision like that, why should it be any meaningful to me? So how about Peter's? It's a beautiful debate. Yeah. And then she says, Well, don't you think we're talking to God or do you really need to have Jesus around? He's not around anymore. So he says, Do you think that anyone who has a vision is lying? It's a really good question. So using the the character of Mary Magdalene and retelling the story from that perspective has real depth and will introduce certain issues that another character would not introduce. This is how you should do with Matthew. And then you realize, oh my God, he has a genealogy. Well, you found out because the title tells you according to Matthew. Who's Matthew? Ah, he's a tax collector. Of course he has records. Of course he knows who's related to whom. Uh, he'd be a good person. Yeah? So if you read the, the beginning of the New Testament to an American audience in classroom, um, this was the son of this and begot this and begot this, they're asleep in the, in the third or fourth sentence. Yeah? If you imagine a second century uh, reader who may have asked, how could someone from Nazareth, Nazareth is never mentioned in the Old Testament, be the son of David? Really? I mean, this is so obviously a lie or historically wrong. I mean, how, I mean could, uh, yeah, he found a genealogy. You will have a quiet room. You will list where, and it ends with, it doesn't end with David. David is just in the middle part. Then it continues and it goes all the way to Joseph. But then unfortunately it's not the father, but that's from a legal point of view is not, not the real issue. So using the persona of a tax collector makes complete sense for the beginning. Also, the, la the last sentence of this is the only gospel that has an appearance of Jesus, you know, on the mountain, what we call the Great Commission. And Jesus, it says the 11 were there. Yeah? Matthew was one of them. And Jesus says, now please go out into the world and tell everyone what I taught. And, well, that's what this book is about. It's written in the language of the word, world in Greek, and it is about Jesus' teaching. Yeah? Uh, you have a a one, it's a Gospel of Matthew from a literary critical point of view. It's a beautiful, it's, if you allow yourself to read it the way it should be. Yeah? And so what you, what you just said when we're rehearsing the two-source theory, they assume mm. there's a different author of the first century who wrote one part, a different author of the second century. And they do not appreciate that this is not the kind of genre that would want to do that. This is a genre like Mary Magdalene's. Uh, position who wants to make a statement that is valuable for the readership that they're working for in the second century. You cannot break them up into different, you know, the ones are Jews, the others are Hellenists. So, no, because it's all in the same book. Both of them are reading this book. Mm -hmm. So that's the explanation, um, is the explanation for the common material should not be sorted out uh, differentiated between what Matthew and, and Luke have in common, or uh, but Mark, you know, the, the separation of uh, uh, Q only uh, came into existence because they were trying to explain why Mark doesn't have it. Hmm? But if you look at the other Gospels as creative writing exercises, it, it's, it's at least Matthew and Mark, then of course. Uh, and, and Luke, yeah, uh, uh, they will have parallels, they will have literal parallels, because the idea is, yes, the tradition that Marcia has is right, but it is as, uh, what did, adulterated is mm. how is the word that, that, that to the unused, we have the originals. It continues also that they also give you the name of who put it together, who the editor is. It's mentioned in the in introduction of, of the Gospel of, of Luke, it's Theophilus. It's the only time an editor is mentioned. Is dear Theophilus, I put it together for you. And there are these two others. Well, they are also there. Yeah, Theophilus collects it all and presents it. When does Theophilus live? Well, the latest record in the story, what I call the editorial narrative, will be before Paul dies, the end of Acts. So you have a situation where the editor, who also put the Gospel of John together says, I have this manuscript, we know it's from John, and so, and at the end he says, if we, if we publish everything we know about Jesus, I think, singular person, so, uh, that the whole world couldn't hold those books. So if you read it as a literary unity, like you read, again, Harry Potter, any, any kind of a collection, um, 
then you're looking for an editor in the first person singular. There's only one other place that gives you the name Theophilus. This is, from a literary point of view, absolutely acceptable. James Joyce, read James Joyce that way. It's absolutely acceptable. In a, in a book like Ulysses, where every chapter follows a different genre, it's absolutely acceptable that it's always the same person. Yeah? Um, but if you look at it by making falling into the trap of the provenance narrative, that this is all goes back to sources from the first century that miraculously have disappeared, but we're kept quoting, yeah, we're kept in the archives, yeah, and now, um, now are available and accessible, yeah. Uh, then this is it's interesting that both the real right wing conservative Christian and the most liberal historical thing fall into the same trap. As if they were not able to understand and you read Mickey Mouse that this ne never really happened, you know. And it doesn't. It doesn't mean this is bad. They're just trying to make something out of a, a, a book that the genre doesn't want to be. And then you always miss. It doesn't matter with which genre do you, you do it. You know, if you take a joke seriously, yeah, you, you end up in a lawsuit. Yeah. But if the judge then says, well, any really. Any person would have known yeah, that this is a joke. This is irony. This is this, and because it says it on the cover of the of the magazine, you know, they're thrown out of court. So the misinterpretation of of, of genre is is uh, is not good. And this would be another argument that the two source theory only works if they think they have documents there yeah, that are from the first century. It's exactly what they're supposed to think. Um, in my in, in my book, I go through these. I give these examples about uh, uh, gospels, other gospels, and I also show modern examples. This, this is not a problem of antiquity. It is a problem of dealing with with this kind of uh, pseudonymous literature. And if they are with intent, if they have the intent to deceive you about true authorship, so for example, the Hitler Diaries upset a lot of my colleagues. Are a great example to show that. Also, what they do with Q happened there, that the historians were looking for inconsistencies in order to find whether this is historical or not. And mm. then the, they looked for handwriting examples. Yes, for, because they, they were all like, yeah, they were all autographs, the, the Hitler diaries. They were looking for handwriting of Hitler. They found one, compared it. Yes, it was the same handwriting. Because the handwriting was also done by the forger. The, the, the example to show them what was this. this. These are strategies that have always been used and will always be used. Yeah, uh, and don't fall into that trap. So that would be the short version. So if you assemble this in a diagram, if mm -hmm. you could describe it, um, which one, uh, which one of them came first? I mean, um, and then which one does the last? In the diagram. Yeah, so this is something where I that I refuse to do. Okay. Uh, in in some sense, not completely, of mm -hmm. course, because it, 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 it increases the uh, plausibility if you can say where it comes from. But for, as a method, as a scholarly method, I think you should start with evidence. And when it comes to literature, you start with what you have. And we only have four gospel was one of the examples. We only have the collection. We don't have the single writings. So. If there were single writings, this is one possibility from the first century, but we don't have records about that. So there's no proof for it. Or if you take the other example, we look at other gospels of the same time and, and see that they're all pulled out of thin air. They're, they're, it's poetic license. It's, a, it's what, a, what a pastor will do every Sunday on, on the pulpit, and he never goes to prison for that. There's nothing wrong about that. Um, then uh, I, I'd say, you know, unless you really show me some some clear proof, like we'd have a manuscript with uh, three quarters of Mark, uh, completely, you know, it doesn't have to be from the first century, it could be from the sixth century, so but clearly has their own pedigree. This wasn't, this, uh, then, then, then I'll be the happiest guy in the world and say, yeah, now we actually have something where we can build our theory on. But I'm not interested in in uh, information about how great John is and how deep theology it has. In this case, it's, it's not relevant because, uh, from a historical point of view, it's absolutely not relevant because uh, the meaning of a text, a text means nothing until you put it into a certain context. 
if you put it in the wrong context, it might mean still mean very much to you, but it will not uh, pass the scholarly discourse uh, bar. So what really happened, I do not know, but I think what you can argue for, I tried to present. And as I'm, you know, going into retirement is probably the last time I talk about it. So I hope the same thing doesn't happen again, what happened with my first book, that people will read it and first they don't react and then they understand and they put it in their dictionaries, but they don't really take the next step uh, and, and read the consequence that we really know very little about Jesus. I went to the, we we're here in San Antonio. Yesterday I walked by the Alamo Museum site there. I think you can learn more about the historical Jesus by visiting the site here about Alamo than you do by reading the New Testament. You go there, you see old, old walls, the broken down. Yeah, so this is where they, they were fighting. Uh, you only hear people who will put it in a context that these are heroes yeah? um, who, who you know, fought to the last bullet. And you have quotes of what they said, cross this line or whatever, I can't even read, that are almost of canonical importance. Yeah? Last sentences, the, the, the different guys said before they died. You know, yeah, the, what is it, the blinds, the deaf, the deaf Smith, so, so who didn't hear the commands, and he's the only one who survived there yeah, because he didn't know he was. Not, it, it, these are stories and such and such. But these walls over there, just driving down San Antonio, you see half torn down buildings, some old, some new everywhere. They mean absolutely nothing without the story. And if I look at it, I say, well, what is celebrated here? People who committed suicide, yeah? They knew it was completely... I have no feeling for that kind of heroism. I don't think this is right. If you are like me, yeah? And this is established, of course, European history of World War II, neighbors killing each other for hundreds of years and then trying to stop doing it. Um, American, uh, those who run that museum would, would not be able to run their gift shop if they didn't have the story of patriotism and nationalism and if it didn't feed into the emotional side and from there on the emotional side will also read the Bible and they will think they're the chosen country and the chosen people. Other places of the world, they don't think that way. Yeah, It's a very American way. So you can learn more, <laughs> to go back again, about historical Jesus if you take serious what they're doing over there at the Alamo site because this is exactly what was happening in the second century. They were taking old you know, so names, uh, storylines, such and such. If they were written down or not, it's not, it's not the essential question. But they were there. These other Gospels, they don't introduce the 12 apostles. They don't always start. They don't never tell where Jesus was, or rarely. They assume that you know that. Right? And here you have, it's the only example so far that we know is the Marcionite edition that actually tries to pull together a Jesus story from birth to death. And this is what they took to add the other three. Yeah, they, they took this framework, and the other three are either different takes, so some Matthew and Mark. Let's pretend I'm Mark. Let's pretend I'm Matt. I listen to Mark. I listen to Peter. This is what he said. Or let's pretend I'm John. I'm the last one still alive. But, you know, they've got so much wrong. So instead of retelling everything, he simply picks up certain stories. Look, what do you have? This was a horror that washed Jesus' feet? Nope. Hmm. I was there. I, John, was there. This was Mary, the sister of Martha, the sister of Lazarus. She's a good girl. Yeah? And then whole chapter. Um, the, 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 he brought back a, a young man to life. Look, two sentences. This was Lazarus. I gives a whole chapter. Jesus was gone, and they called, and it didn't come immediately. He had bad thoughts about it. And when the guy came out, he was stinking. I was there. I smelled it. You know, This is the report of the beloved disciple who sat next to Jesus. This is what we want to communicate. But it is packaged by the editor who discovered this. Now, you put the story together by Theophilus. Yeah? And I, I also added footnotes. So you should print the, which is long-standing insight. This is not, had nothing to do with me. My is just if you apply this theory to this text, 
those passages that are seen in, in, in John as an aside, where the narrator stops telling the story, but looks at the audience and tells them, teacher, uh, this is, uh, no, no, rabbi, uh, this translated teacher, come over to my house. Yeah, so he, we should have a footnote. We, when we would print it, we would print it with footnotes. We would not interrupt the, the thing. And um, so you have this, 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 um, prayers, these things in the Gospel of John and in the book of Revelation that start out with John telling something, and all of a sudden someone picks up and makes a sermon out of it. Yeah, these are the additions, and they were marked, and uh, Theophilus doesn't hide his name, doesn't hide himself in the Gospel of John. It's a very different genre from Matthew. Mm -hmm. so, so in this book, I, I, the last part, I thought maybe I would like more people to to follow through with this. So I'm just giving, went through the all 27 writings and just briefly sketched out synoptic problem, how this completely is different now. Um, and at the end, you really, the big thing that will really hurt, if this is correct, it's not a uh, historical Jesus that we can't really say much about him. This is, everyone in the field knows that anyway. Yeah. You don't have to do it as complicated as I do. But the real difficult thing is, why in the world do we think that Paul ever existed? Hmm. Uh -huh. Isn't, couldn't, because we now see that the, they added so much to Paul in, the, in their edition of the Marcionite edition, you know, if this is, that uh, you really wonder yeah, if the only thing that was really, or the most important thing in the letters of Paul in the beginning of Galatians is that there's only one gospel. And if anyone comes and brings you another one, even if it's an angel, they're lying. Yeah. And if this wasn't the letters of Paul weren't simply there to authenticate this gospel that he refers to as something that I received from before, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, without giving any kind of um, any kind of sources or reasoning for that. So that's exactly what the Marcionite edition looks like—a gospel, anonymous gospel. Jesus. It's not even clear mm. of his relationship to Son of God. He disappears at the end. There's no ascension. Yeah, all of that needs to be fixed in the canonical edition. So you're saying that the the epistles of Paul, at least to you, look look like they they seem like that they are, that they were created in their original form yes. before they were added to significantly yeah. mm -hmm. to confirm the Marcion's and Evangelium. Okay. Exactly. Because mm -hmm. here you have an, um, clearly he writes very early, mm -hmm. Paul, so as early as four or five weeks. If you just use uh, mm -hmm. five weeks after the uh, resurrection, he never saw Jesus, mm -hmm. which is for the readership ex extremely important because they also never saw Jesus. He describes his, his what <laughs> Acts makes a conversion experience, but how could you convert? From a Jew to being a Jew, you know, uh, is is as an out of body experience in Second Corinthians twelve. You know, uh, I don't know. Was me? Was it? Uh, he sees himself from the outside. He talks about himself in third person, and then God talks. He's sick. Yeah, and he asks God to please heal him, and then God says, "No, I'm not going to heal you. You know, my grace is sufficient for you." Hmm. And that defines this character, and it also defines second century readership, and also defines us. I had to train pastors, yeah. I could not train them how to go into a hospital and heal the sick. I could train them what Paul had in his message, yeah. That it'll all be good, and uh, if you encourage people to accept their sickness, yeah. Um, and so... So it, it is a, it's a, it somehow it, it uses a fictitious character, maybe, maybe fictitious, or a historical character, but giving them a mm -hmm. voice, like the other writings of the second century do. And what I feel a very meaningful, a uh, very deep sense, I, I, I've never really had love of the, this Christian movement to think that um, being healthy is the only way you can prove you're a good Christian. It, you, you know, um, and... What I mean, but uh, here comes, of course, my socialization as a Lutheran uh, in, in, in Europe, you know, but being able to deal with, uh, with the defeats, with the sense of loss, if people die, if 
close friends, brothers die. Um, uh, that I felt was 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 a, a, a very valid message from for me from reading the New Testament. So in hindsight, I think maybe this is why I started my scholarly work with with reading Paul. So at the end of my uh, scholarly career, so to say, to realize that. I fell into the same trap. Yeah, uh, somehow it's a little sad, but I'm not the only one. But on the other hand, it enriches my experience. I'm actually talking to a fellow Christian from the second century, who's communicating in a very complicated way because I'm a complicated person in a complicated society, and think scholarship brings you closer to the truth, or so which it doesn't. Uh, it, and it communicates something to me that is uh, that I need to hear. You know. Uh, could you imagine literature or any kind of art doing a better service and trying to reflect on who you are and helping you through through tough decisions? That that that's why we read. This is why we read literature. And in my closing question, can you talk about um, a bit about uh, Polycarp and why you believe that he's the one that assembled the New Testament? Yeah. Really? So early on, when I thought I need to identify the person, um, the providence narrative that is uh, provided by the different always leads to Polycarp. Um, he's a bishop of um, uh, the bishop of Smyrna, and it's not quite clear when he died, but between 155, 165, it's the interpretation of the records where some differ. But it doesn't matter; it's the middle of the second century, and. He says that he travels to Rome, and one of the reasons, one of the things that they, that he has to discuss with his Roman, uh, the Roman Pope at the time, let me just say it shortly, you know, the, the guy who ran the other part of the Christian world in, in this narrative. <laughs> Egypt is not, never, never there. Um, and the, the, big, the big difficulty for them is to decide on the practice of the church when to celebrate Easter. And if you haven't realized uh, yet, now as a Christian, Christianity has never been able to celebrate uh, Easter on the same day, the most important holiday. And the reason for that is actually the four gospel books. So in the Gospel of John, um, Jesus never celebrates the Passover meal. He dies at the same time that the lamb is sacrificed. Whereas in the first three Gospels, the lamb is sacrificed and eaten and in the evening. So it's actually a Passover meal. And uh, then the next day he dies. So this is our Thursdays when we do our Passover in the Catholic tradition. But this has not been really, this is different. Now, the other problem is that it's based on the on the cal calendar, on the moon calendar, and Passover is celebrated on a different uh, day every year. So by knowing those when Passover was on Friday, you would come up with a different year of his death. Then you have to combine Passover with Pilate. Yeah? So how often was Passover on a Friday during Pilate's uh, term? And then you come up with a certain uh, number of years. If you think that Passover was celebrated on Thursday, it would be different years. And so we, you know, if we knew when Jesus died, we would celebrate not Easter, we would say, or, or we would celebrate, this is 1921st anniversary. We don't do that because we don't know. And it's a problem of the records. In the second century, when Christianity with the Catholic just means there's only one, church all and it should have everyone in there there can only be one god and can only be one church and they had this kind of global uh, identity they couldn't accept uh, practices like that that are um, uh, that are so divisive I have to you know they celebrate on different days the most important holiday so the Romans thought about excommunicating the uh, Asian Minor Christianity, we're not part of the, you're not Catholics. And the Asian uh, the Minor Asian community uh, returned the favor. Mm -hmm. And so the two leaders meet. And that's a historical thing, and it's always part of this provenance article and uh, provenance narrative. And if and when they meet, 
they discuss it and then they say, decide it's not important. Mm. Just let everyone do the same thing. It's something churches never again done. Yeah. It is very unusual. It's a big, you just, Constantine, one of the first things he did was uh, say that's not true. And he set that calendar. Yeah. Uh, but that's much later. And so you, if you want to date literature to a certain period of time, and I have the editorial interest, the editorial interest clearly says we have four Gospels. They disagree on when Jesus died, but the position is it doesn't matter. Then you have a link to a historical uh, event that can be dated with Polycarp and Anicetus. And that was... That was my early early thought, and so this is something that needs to be uh, clearly um, taken seriously from a historical perspective. But then again, I, I, I and then it, it continues like that. Polycarp knows Onesimus, yeah. uh, who is mentioned in Philemon, the letter to Philemon. I said mm -hmm. Onesimus is a bishop, becomes a bishop in Ephesus, mm -hmm. and all of that is clearly. If Polycarp had said that these letters of Paul that clearly were published from an autograph or not an autograph and he'd never seen them, it would have no chance to be published. Yeah. So his, his signing off on this is, is another important historical observation that needs to be uh, considered. But I now understood um, that that could also be someone like Irenaeus who lives a few decades later, just knowing the story is enough for him to appear. Uh, and uh, it may, might very well be that uh, he wanted me to think <laughs> that it was Polycarp. Um, these are murky waters, and we'll go to heaven independent of the decision how this is going to be resolved. But as scholars, our job is to do our best and to introduce new insights, uh, new data, and answer old questions. Well, thank you for joining me today, David Trogus. Thank you very much. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.